Oh, th thank you, and thanks for the opportunity to talk here today. And I'm, I'm going to focus on the evaluation part of the prediction of extremes. And I'm going to uh, we try to cover different time scales and discuss how, how we evaluate forecasts and what we can what we can learn from them. But 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 first, and now, now I'm going to sound a bit downbeat in an event uh, where we're talking about the uh, predicting extremes using probabilistic forecast and say whether we were right or not. But if it, uh, strictly speaking, we cannot uh, verify a, a single life life threatening event from a probabilistic point of view. Uh, f first, because we do, do not know the two probability distribution on a certain time range. We only know the single outcome in the end, but we do not know what the two uncertainties we, we had when we had to make the decision. Then, fortunately, life-threatening events are usually rare. When we talk, talk about this type of events, it's usually a return period of 20 years. So it's too, too small to make a, a, to get the sample to make good statistics on. And then on top of that, the, each event is uh, quite, quite unique in the way that uh, it, it could be a series of precipitation events that in the end leads up to a flooding. And uh, or, or when we talk about coastal floodings, we can have precipitation that causes a runoff in rivers that in the combination with waves and then if a windstorm leads to storm surge and that in the end leads to coastal flooding. So we have all these different uh, elements. And then when we talk about heat waves, it's also the length of the event and not only the single peak and whether, whether or not they, uh, how the night temperature were compared to the daytime temperatures. So in that respect, all, all, all events there are, are unique. So what, what we could do is to run statistical uh, verification of less extreme events, typically uh, one in 20, uh, 20 days, one in 100 days, uh, verified in 95th or 99 percentile. Then we can also evaluate the model climatology, so see if the model on average can capture the tail of the, the tails of the PDF in the observations. But, but then we can also look at the case studies and learn about important aspects to make these predictions. And all, all these things one can do in conjunction and together to get, get the good evaluation and knowledge about how well we predict extremes. So when I talk about multi-scale uh, multi predictability, and uh, we're going to look on what uh, predictability drivers are. So for, fortunately, Cyril have introduced us to uh, probability distribution functions already. So here you see four examples, where in black you had the uh, climatology for uh, the, uh, this time of the or year this example was for, is a summer day. And uh, then in colored lines is the PDF from the ensemble. So the, the one furthest to the left, we can imagine being far, far away from the day we want to forecast, typically a month away. And we see very little difference between our forecast and our uh, climatological PDF. But then we get a little bit closer to the event. They two, two weeks before the event, when they ending up in the second plot, so what we typically call extended range forecast. So we start to see a shift of the whole PDF to, towards uh, warmer weather, and also the tail is pushed up a, a, a bit. Then when we get into the me medium range prediction, the example here is with a, a blue line. Then we start to see a uh, gathering of the ensemble members on the extreme end, but still a fairly wide PDF. But then when we get into the short range, we get a more narrow uh, PDF on the extreme side, but still with some uncertainty. So another way to 
illustrate the, this evolution is in the bottom left plot. And I, I'm going to use this type of plot quite, quite a lot. So what you see here are all forecasts produced for specific uh, valid, valid day. So if I'm starting from the left, we have the longest forecast. So it's from our extended range forecast system, but still valid on a single day. But they are produced twice a week, so then you see they are not so frequent. When we get up to 15 days before the event, we get more blue box and whiskers, and that's when we produce forecast every 12 hour. Then when we get into 10 days before the event, you start to get the red dots, and that's when we start to get our high resolution forecast, HRES. But then to have something to compare this with, we produce a reforecast data set to make an estimate of the model climate. And that's what you see in the red box and whisker, where the dashed line is the median of the model climate for this specific point, for this specific time of the year. And then what you see on the top with a triangle and a red line is the maximum uh, that we got out from this uh, with forecast data set that's uh, based on 1,200 forecasts from the past. So it's an estimate of an upper bound, but it's a not perfect sampling on the very tail. And uh, as you can see in this example, and I forgot to say about the box and whisker that the endpoints is going from 1% to 99%. And uh, a, fi a thinner box, which is probably quite difficult to see, is from 10 to 90. Then the thicker box is from 25 to 75%. So that would co cover the range Cyril gave in his example about the, uh, the decision for the kids to stay up. And then the black box is the ensemble median. So in this case, you can actually see that the, the forecast in the end went outside its climatology. And the, that, that could either be that we're living in a changing climatology or that this event is so rare that it hasn't been yet sampled in this, although with the 1,200 forecast still limited a data set for the uh, uh, climatology. So how, how, how can this evolution from very long forecast into the shortest range and observation look? And uh, I, I've selected here five different plots. So again, we have the same plot as before to the up left. And we see in the extended range that we started to gain some signal of, in this case, being warmer than normal. And uh, when, when we get to day 15, actually the ensemble median is on the 75th percentile of the model climatology. So that's pretty strong signal 15 days out. But then around uh, between day 10 to day 7, you see this very sharp increase in signal going to extreme uh, uh, heat and then four days uh, uh, before the event until uh, the last forecast. The uh, signal is pretty stable, but one can see that the ensemble spread is narrowing. Unfortunately, in this case, the observation in Green Star ended up e even higher, so outside uh, the uh, distribution. And we will come back to that. The second example on the top, we see a, a still a gradual uh, increase in uh, signal, in this ca case for a windstorm. But then we see a very sharp increase or change from uh, one day to another. You see this sh sharp increase where the, this very little overlap between two consecutive PDFs. So, in that case, it was some information coming in with a data simulation that quickly changed the forecast. Then, but bottom left, you see an example of a false alarm in the medium range, 
we, first we had no signal, then we started to gain signal as in the two to top example. Mm -hmm. We uh, had the ensemble members at some point that peak with precipitation uh, three times the maximum of the modern climate. But then the, the signal started to drop and in the end it was a wet day but uh, around the 95th percentile of the modern climate. So that's an example of false alarm. Then we started to get into more and more of the nightmares of the forecasters here. So the uh, uh, middle plot in the bottom we started off with no si signal until uh, quite near the event, then we started to gain signal. But then the signal dropped back again and until the very two last forecasts before the event, when it uh, quickly went up again. This is what one can call uh, also in the ensemble world, a jumpiness in the forecast. And the, the worst one is the one to the uh, bottom right here. We had no signal for a long time. Then we got, got signal a bit about the wet day. Then the uh, signal went down and was quite quite uh, close to the modern climatology, a little bit of uh, uh, rain that day. Then we ended up with a rainfall twice the maximum in the uh, modern climatology, so a, a really devastating event with very little signal. Now we will come back to a few of these events in this talk. So let's start with the one I started off with. Uh, uh, on the, the top left, which was a, a, actually how the evolution for the temperature looked for the two meter temperature over London, the 90s, oh, sorry, after the, the June, it, of course it'd be July uh, this year. So it was the record breaking day in the UK and when uh, London Heathrow reached, I think, 40.2 uh, de degrees. So we are going to Look at this one on different time scales. So starting starting off from the extended range, and uh, here, here we now look at the two meter temperature predictions for the full summer. Uh, so uh, these are composites of forecast analysis and forecast valid 6th of June to 28th of August. So what you see on the top is the average anomaly over the past summer for Europe and other parts of the world. So pretty, pretty red and orange of uh, uh, Western Europe. And uh, on the right, uh, top right, is the precipitation anomaly from era five, who also had a very, very dry summer in a large part of Europe. Then the next rows are composites of two week forecast valid the same period. And again, you see that we uh, a similar pattern, both in temperature and uh, precipitation anomalies. So on a two week time scale, we ca capture quite well these anomalies. But what, what is even more striking is when we start to look at composites of six week forecasts. So if, if we each week, looked six weeks ahead and then uh, was averaging this six week forecast. We still see a de decent warm anomaly and a dry anomaly over Europe, while I other parts were not so, so good. So if you look at northern Russia into the Arctic, you see that we did not capture this very warm anomaly we saw in the uh, observation. So for, from this type of diagnostic one can ask the question, and unfortunately I do not have the answer now, but it's an interesting scientific question where this predictability also on a six week time scale originated from. So then if we move over to the medium range, uh, we here see oh, oh, to the left oh, yeah, oh, yeah, observations, uh, and uh, if it's a uh, red, a uh, symbol, uh, the observation was warmer than the 99th percentile of the uh, observation climatology for the, for the 19th of July. 
And then we see probability forecast for, for the probability of being above the 99th percentile of the moderate climatology. So being on the really extreme plane. And this is a six day forecast. At the first glance, we see that there's a <coughs> pre pre pretty decent ma match between observations and the probability map. But then when one starts to look into the details, one can start to get the impression that the model didn't propagate the heat wave uh, with the correct speed to the northeast. We have too, too high probability under it in northwestern uh, France, where it didn't exceed the 99th percentile, but it did it the day before. And then we have fairly low probabilities over Germany, uh, where while the uh, heat wave had propagated that in reality. So but from the, looking at this time scale, one can now come up with a, a question whether the ensemble propagated the heat wave with the correct speed. And then one can go back and build more statistics on that quantity. And then mo moving into the short range, what you see here are ensemble plumes for uh, uh, from a one day forecast, the so very short ensemble forecast where each ensemble member is in the light blue color. The HRS forecast is in red and uh, then you have the free observation stations that we picked up in London. So St. James's Park, Heathrow and Norfolk. And the, you, you, you can see when we get into this he uh, peak of the heat wave, all three stations was far above the uh, ensemble distribution. While during the night time, two of the stations were inside the plume and while one was uh, colder. So then, then the question is uh, what caused this very short, uh, short error? Lack of, pre was it lack of predictability? Could be, but in that case, it was not represented by the ensemble at all. Or representation error. So what was it that they the making a grid box average? Then we didn't capture the peak, but here we had three stations, and uh, that that makes it very unlikely that that would be the reason. So it's probably a, a model error. And after this one, uh, we looked into it, and I picked up this one from uh, Johnny Day in the back back of the audience and looking into the verification of the two meter temperature biases uh, for the full summer 2020, where we have the daily minimum to the left and daily maximum to the right. And here you can see for large part of Europe, we were too warm during the night and too cold during the day uh, daytime. So we had two uh, uh, little, uh, low amplitude in the Diana cycle and underestimated the daily maximum. So what we saw in the case of the London temperature actually for, hold for the statistics of the year, and then one can start to look into the model and other processes. So that's what well, was the example of three different timescales. Now, now we quickly move through uh, the two of the other uh, examples I gave. And, this really nasty one where we had no, almost no signal in the shortest forecast and ended up with a very extreme precipitation. Was this flooding in Italy in uh, September this year, where, 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 you, where you can see in the observation plot a band of observations and uh, this uh, uh, a rectangular marks the worst region. So if we look into the medium range prediction, the seven, seven day and looking at the extreme forecast index, we, we actually had some signal in the extreme forecast index seven days before, and but just to the west of the worst affected region. We also see that we had a very strong water vapor flux into that region, which is a signaling that it could especially in orographic enhanced situation lead to strong rainfall. So there, there, there were 
science in the medium range forecast, but still when we look, also look at in the shortest forecast and the precipitation field, we, we got the worst precipitation on the upfront of uh, the Apennines and not having convective cells actually crossing the mountain range, which we believe are due to that we're using the permanent rice convection that not, it cannot advect cells. <coughs> and then the third example with uh, the, this jumpiness was from a uh, flood north of Brisbane uh, the, this week. When we look at, uh, so this is a three day accumulation of precipitation. So first we have a concatenation of very short range forecasts or saved analysis. Then you see this uh, black uh, reading with more than 50 millimeters and 750 millimeters maximum. And this is from the model output. Those are even higher station value, values in reality. But we see that the model was capable to produce something really extreme. And also the shortest forecast was had the extreme. But if you look at number three on the bottom left, you see almost no precipitation over, over land, but still over ocean. So it was something that made this flip-flopping, flip not only in a deterministic forecast, but in the ensemble way that was probably due to the initial conditions. So by, by, by looking into cases like this, we, we can start to look into different categories of uh, errors and uh, that need to be uh, uh, looked into in different ways. So in medium range, we are usually discussing synoptic non-systematic errors. They're usually initial condition errors or the model error leading to uh, error growth and uh, uh, uncertainties and errors. And that's what we usually use our ensemble forecast for. But then we have non-growing model biases. So typically, if, um, bias uh, errors in the physics, in, uh, such as the example of propagation of the uh, uh, precipitation cells, uh, where convective cells are mentioned, that if, uh, the, uh, the, we have similar type of systematic errors day one and day 10, day 15. So then we can look into what's happened day one to understand it. So even if we work with medium range forecast, yeah, only our verification day one uh, could, could help us. And then one can also use post-processing uh, against observations uh, to mitigate it. And then we have growing mo model biases that also are due, due to model errors, but this typically affecting the extended range where we use our forecast to bias correct. Then the fourth is the representation errors where things happen inside the grid box. And uh, because we're looking at grid box averages, we are not sampling what happened inside the grid box. But for that, we can, uh, be, uh, we, we have to wait for higher resolution, but meantime, we can do some on some of the spread inflation or use a product like these easy points we have here. But then the final one is the interpretation uh, error. So when we look at pro uh, products, uh, the message is not coming out. And I think that's a really in interesting area where the forecast was ha had the information, but the way the products or how the message was conveyed to the public yeah, were not capturing it. Uh, so I, 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 I think I will, I will stop with uh, this, this plot. And now, now again, we look at the similar uh, ensemble evolution plot. The, the problem is that we stop here. We do not have what's happened uh, up here. And what we see here is for snow depth in Reading next Thursday. Uh, where, where where the forecast starts to show uh, so, some significant uh, amount of snow in some ensemble members. And yesterday, our age rest was above the 99 percentile with 
18 millimeters of snow equivalent. So th this this might be a, a it will be the question: Will this start to gain a signal, or will it die out, or will it go, go above uh, the, the the red line? And we, we will be we be able to fly out to Sweden next Saturday. So thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice classification of the different problems in, in ensemble forecasting. Um, do you have any questions, please? Thanks very much. Yeah, really uh, interesting talk there, Alain and Vanessa. And, um, yeah, I think uh, while working on operational forecasts, yeah, I'm not going to try and second guess just at the moment what's going on in Reading next Thursday, although it is a very interesting period coming up, as we know. And it was, it was more about the, the temperature forecasts on that exceptional day uh, back in July the 19th. And um, I think your graphic showed it nicely. In, in operational forecasting, there's been this idea for a little while that the, the sort of maximum temperatures on, on the ECMDRF model seem to be a bit below um, what, what is observed a lot of time, especially in these extreme situations. And one, one observation more than anything was that looking at forecast um, soundings on that day, especially, um, it, it didn't seem to be quite enough uh, super adiabatic stuff down near the surface, which whereas some other global models, and I won't sully the run by mentioning <laughs> rival organisations that actually went too far the other way and had an extreme super adiabat near the surface and were going for things like 43, 44 degrees. So, yeah, I'm just interested in knowing if I guess there is work to ongoing and they're trying to mitigate those kind of things yes so 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 one thing and that's uh, not 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 the uh, 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 complete answer but we, we we still do not have a, a city tiles so we're not uh, simulating the effect of uh, cities in, in our model so uh, london in our model is a grass field uh, but uh, that, that, that's not the uh, complete answer, uh, and uh, uh, because also outside London we weren't underestimating the temperatures. And uh, I, I think you're cor correct about the super adiabatic. And I don't know, and uh, may, maybe Richard can answer in the below. But the, to my knowledge, uh, hydrostatic models should not be able to have a super adiabatic. Or... Yeah. Yeah, so there are diagnostics that you can think mm, present absolute values, but as you have shown, this uh, the model has very serious systematic errors with the underestimation of the diurnal cycle. So in that case, uh, and looking at these plots, um, would it be more useful to plot um, a calibrated forecast or calibrated probability? Because uh, the forecasts just show it on the extended range Still, the map showed uh, quite uh, significant uh, mean and warm uh, anomaly. However, it doesn't translate that that plot is, is, there is not a match between that plot and the map. So I see that you have the climatology of the model at day five, but uh, the climatology of the model at week six is very different. Okay, <laughs> Yeah, no. Yeah, uh, see, see if I have any good, good thoughts. So yeah, I I, mean, I think on this type of plot it would be useful if if one have an observation equivalent to see where is the uh, red, red bar for the observations. That that would help to see how the systematic errors are, and then one can uh, co compare. But then with a the different type of errors, I uh, explained. What I feel, feel, think uh, we, we, we should more start to uh, uh, separate this is growing errors with lead times and the errors that is present on all lead times and in the into the extended range we get the mix of both. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I um, I'm interested in that. Uh, the table you mentioned about modeling error. Um, so I wonder, is that uh, modeling error apply to all kinds of variables 
uh, not only temperature. Yeah, this one. Yeah, yeah. I, th I, th I think it could be applied to uh, all, all kinds of variables. I, I, I just started to elaborate with this uh, table. So it's the first time I show it in a presentation. So it's, uh, but uh, uh, then if I look at the uh, upper level uh, uh, observations like Z500, then, then it's very little of this non-growing model biases. Well, well, it's more of um, this sy sy synoptic uh, non-systematic error that uh, do dominate the total error. And then in the longer ranges one, we get the model drift of these growing biases. Yeah. And they're definitely, definitely not the representation error for such an ensemble. I wonder, if it, is, is there any review paper on, on this, um, you know, uh, the longer version of this explanation for these errors? Uh, not, not that I'm, I'm aware of. Some, someone knows, let, let me know. I, I, otherwise, I'll put it into my two-year plan to write it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ernest. Um, just, just a comment really on um, bias correction and recalibration. Because I think we have to be aware of the fact that, of course, we're looking here at some of the most extreme events, and those are the ones that are most difficult to uh, to bias correct or recalibrate. For exactly the same reasons we were talking about difficulty of verifying them, um, is that we don't have good data for uh, enough data to do a reliable calibration for the behaviour in a case of extremes. We it was mentioned just now the issue of superadiabats in the model, specifically when we have very, very high temperatures. Um, and uh, as was hinted from the back, um, we did have a different uh, issue in the MetaVis model, but we don't have the, 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 the biases we're seeing there are not typical of the same as the biases we see on a normal day-to-day -day basis. So it's not straightforward to be able to sort of bias correct or recalibrate those uh, specific events. And I think you mentioned on your slide the option of using the reforecasts so of doing it to do do that, which gives you the best sort of data set you can have for it. But it's probably still going to struggle when you get the real extremes because we just again don't have enough samples to do it. Yes. Uh, and and in the in the in the model world, uh, uh, every, everything uh, uh, above the red line is un un uncharted territory in a way. <laughs> but, but, because the reforecasts have not gone higher for that specific point. Thank, thank you. Um, you've been looking at verification at the very beginning of the um, of the value chain for uh, forecasting a warning. Um, when you think about uh, one of the challenges that I think we have, and I, and I have no idea how to deal with it, is how you connect the verification at this part of the value chain with the value of the uh, forecast and the warning that you eventually produce in terms of how people act and in terms of uh, what sort of uh, actions are needed to protect them, um, which which may be highly nonlinear. It may be that your forecast was, on this occasion was perfectly adequate for people to take the measures they needed to. But on the other hand, it may be that anything below 40 degrees, they wouldn't do any anything at all. Um, and therefore, it was totally useless. And I, I, I wonder if you, if you have any comment on uh, on any thoughts you've had as to how you connect the verification of the the numbers, if you like, with the evaluation of of the value of the product that you're producing. Yes, no, it's uh, a, a, a really good comment, and I, 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 as you know, we're discussing it a lot in the high weather project, and it. it is an incredibly difficult task because then one is even more down to case to case uh, basis. So one can evaluate and see how people reacted for one case, but then how to upscale it and up, uh, aggregate many cases is very, very difficult. Yeah, 